The agreement between U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to create a framework for Syria to give up its chemical weapons arsenal has sparked criticism from some U.S. lawmakers. They say it's a sign of weakness by the Obama administration. Under these circumstances, what leverage do we have to force Assad's compliance when he starts to lie and cheat and delay using every trick in Saddam Hussein's playbook? Not much, it appears. And the leverage we do have no longer appears credible. To insist otherwise misses the basic reality of this agreement. It was not a product of this administration's strength, but of its weakness, of its inability to, or unwillingness to take the military action it deemed necessary against Assad. Russia sensed this weakness and led the administration, in my view, into a diplomatic blind alley. But U.S. President Barack Obama says the agreement now before the U.N. Security Council is a foreign policy triumph for the United States. As a consequence of the pressure that we've applied over the last couple of weeks, we have Syria first, for the first time acknowledging that it has chemical weapons, agreeing to join uh, the convention that prohibits the use of chemical weapons, and the Russians, uh, their primary sponsor, saying that they will push Syria to get all of their chemical weapons out the distance that we've traveled over these couple of weeks is remarkable. And my position and the United States position has been consistent throughout. So is the kerry Lavrov agreement the right foreign policy move for the Obama administration? Joining me now to discuss this is Steve Clements. He's Washington editor at large for The Atlantic and the founder of the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. Also joining us, Robert Zarate. He's policy director of the Foreign Policy Initiative and a former legislative assistant in the U.S. House of Representatives. Gentlemen, welcome to the heat. Thanks for coming in. Glad to be here. So was the decision to step back from military action a good foreign policy move by the Obama administration? Steve, we'll start with you. I think given the way this unfolded at that moment, it, it was. I, I was one who favored the president taking immediate military action, but once he'd made the decision to go to Congress, at that point, the benefits that have, could have come for the sort of strike that was planned, I think were, were minimal. We're not going to achieve uh, any of the, of the objectives then that they had outlined. Uh, and we were in a real muddle, and, and had that, those resolutions not been passed, you would have seen a precipitous decline in American influence, power of the presidency, and the credibility of the United States, not only in Syria, but throughout the rest of the world. So I, I subscribe to the notion that the Russians gave uh, Barack Obama a, uh, a lifeline, a, a lifeline yeah. and hopefully he won't, get, he won't strangle on it. But I, I do think it was the right call at that moment. Robert, was it a lifeline? Uh, yes, in many ways it was a lifeline. It's clear that President Obama um, if he really wanted to do this strike, should have probably done it and then afterwards uh, gone to Congress under the War Powers Resolution. If he wanted to use uh, military force further, he could have asked for permission. Um, I, I, I'd point out that in Libya, um, the United States used military force to prevent uh, the very sort of thing that uh, Assad has done um, over the last two and a half years um, in Syria, which has killed lots of people, and now with chemical Well, it's weapons. a civil war, but both sides are killing. I mean, sure. there's no doubt about it. But let me ask you this. What about uh, Iraq, the, the kind of the lessons from Iraq? This was a hard sell, not just for the United States president, but also for British Prime Minister David Cameron. And, and isn't that the shadow that they live in because of what happened with Well, it's Iraq. a shadow. I mean, there's certainly this notion that the combined resources of the intelligence establishment, the Defense Department, the State Department, seem not to be enough to convince Americans that there's something really dangerous out there in a country like Syria because of what happened with Iraq. But the big difference is in Iraq, you had an establishment of presidency that wanted to go to war without regard to necessarily what the evidence was. In this case, there's absolutely no doubt you know, even though some congressmen say, we're not sure they have chemical weapons, I say, come on, you know, clearly there are chemical weapons. The UN is, Russia, Rouhani of Iran has acknowledged their chemical weapons. So there's not a, there should not be a credible dispute uh, either about the existence of the chemical weapons stashes or their use. Uh, so Iraq has scared the country away uh, from these sorts of, uh, of endeavors, but it doesn't, you know, if Congress was derelict in its duty on Iraq the first time, it need not be derelict in its duty the second time by doing nothing, and that's that's been the situation. But, but this Iraq, I, I just want to use a, a quote from Hans Blick, and, and he said, uh, what in a way stands accused is this culture of spin, uh, the culture of hyping. Advertisers will advertise a refrigerator in terms that we don't quite believe in, but we expect governments to be more serious and have more credibility, and I think 
seeing the Secretary of State making this persuasive argument, I think a lot of Americans, I mean, it's still two to one against this. We're watching that and saying, we've seen this movie before with Colin Powell. I mean, isn't that the, the legacy of Iraq? I, well, it, uh, you know, the, what happened in Iraq is very different from what happened in Syria. I mean, there was a very objective use of chemical weapons in Syria. Uh, the United Nations just confirmed that. And uh, Western intelligence agencies, uh, as well as Middle Eastern intelligence agencies, confirmed uh, that, that it was the Assad regime that used chemical weapons on a large scale. Um, and and the, uh, the, the circumstantial evidence from the UN report also points to that same conclusion. So in, in many ways, this is a, uh, an apples and oranges comparison. But I'd also add, what worries me most is we had a very clear uh, instance in which a, gr a red line was crossed in Syria. And looking forward with Iran's nuclear program, uh, if and when uh, the Iranians decide to make the decision uh, to get nuclear weapons, when that red line is crossed, uh, it'll be much more ambiguous. And you think this debate's been hard. I worry that the debate over Iran will be even harder. These things are sold a certain way. I mean, Bush, it's shock and awe. This time around, it's pinprick. And I think the American public have come around to the fact that these precision pinprick strikes, this is really, I mean, it's, it's war in a sense, and, and they're not buying it. Um, and and in, in the case of Bush and the Iraq invasion, a lot of this has kind of backfired on the United States. And, I, I think it's backfired on the, on, on the question that it seems increasingly hard for a president or a secretary of state to go out to the American public and be honest and candid about the, what the real calculus are, what the equities of the United States are, and what strategy makes the most sense. Because you didn't hear from John Kerry. You heard John Kerry talk in platitudes about horrors of the chemical weapons, about the children that were dying, and the need to punish Syria. But many people who heard that says, well, punish? Well, what if that escalates? What are the other unexpected consequences? And it took the administration about 12 days to get all of their people in the same message that their calculus should have been changing Assad's estimate. Assad believed he was winning and routing the opposition in the civil war. And so the strike should not only have been used to degrade his forces and, pay, and make them pay a price for chemical weapons, but to change his calculus about his circumstances inside Syria and his neighborhood. Will, will a deal in the UN Security Council, will that do that? If the deal gives the inspectors and the process, uh, those assigned to dis dispose of those chemical weapons, Chapter 7 authority, so that force is aligned behind them in the requests. It is a historic and important move. I see you nodding your head. Yeah, I, I think that's what the United States should uh, shoot for in the UN Security Council. However, I worry that um, Russia uh, will, will not uh, allow that to happen and will uh, in many ways run cover for the Assad regime here and, and uh, try to create higher barriers for the use of force in Syria if and when, as is likely, uh, the Assad regime drags his heels on implementing this agreement and, uh, or, or worse. Uh, I mentioned Iraq, and I know you say it's apples and oranges, so we'll move on from there. But I do want to uh, throw this out there. We had Paul Bremer on the broadcast last week, and, of course, he was the head of the provisional government in, after the invasion in 2003. I asked him about what was achieved by the United States taking military action in Iraq, and, and here's how the exchange went. Let's listen in. If you look at Iraq in August, more deaths than they've seen in five years. There's, there's nothing but chaos in that country. It's not better because the United States got involved. It's worse. No, I think that's flat wrong. I think it is definitely better. I but let's so, go. Let's I mean, go if back. you're seeing that type of but, but level of violence. Let's go back a minute here because people are making very facile comparisons between Iraq and Syria. In the case of Iraq, President Bush sought and received a congressional resolution that authorized the use of force in Iraq. So there is no comparison between Syria and Iraq from a political point of view. It simply doesn't measure up on either the international side or on the domestic political side. Steve, your reaction? I have great respect for Paul Bremer, but I think he's just wrong. That was an open-ended resolution that allowed the administration to chase our enemies all over the entire world. It was a huge, huge hole. Uh, and so it had none of the distinctiveness and clarity of the re resolutions that are being discussed. I think secondly, uh, assigning the fact that there were more deaths after military intervention isn't a really fair assessment either. It's the question of what happened to the, to the state that was holding things together and essentially running Iraq. We disbanded the military. We disbanded significant portions of that state. So one of the big concerns that everyone, the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans, the Saudis have, about Assad Syria and the reason they fear him is they worry about a total collapse of that state. This is a very important dynamic that I think Bremer uh, doesn't, no, doesn't he, fully he missed get. that I think uh, totally. Robert? I, I would add too that there are you know there are lessons to learn from Iraq and um, one lesson that I think uh, the administration probably is struggling to deal with is 
Um, how, how do you actually uh, have, have clear objectives in your strategies? I mean, on the one hand, if you're trying to eliminate Assad's chemical weapons, you at least implicitly uh, have to work with the Assad regime. And that is certainly in tension with any efforts to arm moderate, vetted elements of the armed, uh, Syrian armed opposition. Um, and, and how can you do both things at the same time? It's, it's a very delicate dance. And I think this is the sort of thing, too, that you've, you've heard lawmakers on both sides of the aisle in Congress uh, ask for repeatedly, which is a very clear sense of the strategy going forward in Syria. Well, and, and let me ask you this. Um, can the United States afford to bomb another Muslim country? I mean, isn't there a perception in the region? I mean, when you have drone attacks in Yemen and, and uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, you've, you've got Iraq. I mean, you've got all of these, these elements and now Syria. Uh, if, if I'm a Muslim watching this and I'm saying, well, okay, I, I understand this case. It's a crime against humanity. And yet the United States sat on the sidelines when the Tutsis were being slaughtered during the Rwanda genocide. There, there seems to be a disconnect. Well, well a couple points. One, whatever mistakes the United States has made in the past, we need not make our mistakes hereditary. We are not, we are not imprisoned by our mistakes. Second, um, in, in terms of, of the use of force, can we afford not to respond decisively, and not, not just the United States, but the international community, can we afford not to respond decisively to the use of weapons of mass destruction repeatedly uh, in, in a Middle Eastern country? And I would say the answer is no. And that's why I think you, at, at the very least you've seen the administration, the Obama administration, try to find an answer. I think there is a strong hesitancy to use force in the administration. But there clearly is an understanding that they do need to respond, uh, respond and decisively. Steve, I'm going to give you the last word. I think the question about attacking another Muslim country um, is one where I, I completely agree with my colleague that that not to respond to chemical weapons uh, would send a dangerous signal that would endanger our relations with other nations around the world. But more importantly, I think the question is what happens long term strategically and not getting drawn into something that constrains American power like I think Iraq and Afghanistan did, sending signals to China and to Iran and to other nations in the world that fundamentally America was tied down, militarily overextended and not able to deal with other, other problems. So that's the danger of a country like Syria. You can attack, but you don't want to get drawn down into the pit so that you don't have the resources to deal with Iran or to deal with other contingencies that exist in the system. But that's, the real, that's the real risk. But it's pretty easy to get drawn down into the pit, isn't it? I mean, it is. And I think that's one of the reasons why Barack Obama has been so reticent about uh, being engaged in Syria. He has not run towards this conflict. He's not been enthusiastic about it at all. Uh, and that's what made the credibility of his commitment on this particular case uh, a bit higher. Congress didn't hear that. But his reticence about this was one that he did not want to go to war. This is a reluctant guy. He wants to shift to Asia. He wants to deal with the parts of the world that are growing uh, economically and contribute to stability there. These, these wars in, in, and civil wars and civil strife and the struggle for identity in the Middle East is going to go on for decades. And that's something the United States has to be wary of getting too deeply enmeshed in. Stephen, Robert, thank you both for coming on. Certainly appreciate it. Thank you.